Church of Christ, and as we say each and every week, no matter who you are or where you are on your life journey, you are welcome here. So a very special welcome to visitors and guests who are with us for the first time today. We also want to extend a warm welcome to all who are worshiping with us online at home. So welcome one and all. I would ask now that you please sign in. You will see in the pews there are some red tablets on the inside. Please pick those up, sign in, pass them down the pew and pass them back. We really appreciate that. We also ask those of you who are worshiping with us at home, whether that's local or around the world, to please sign in as well so we might know where you are worshiping with us from today. Following our service, there is a coffee hour, some time for some refreshments and informal conversation, and we really hope that you will join us in the fellowship hall for that. I would just like to introduce very quickly, I know many of you were very excited during the season of The Voice. Ashley Levine, our own Ashley Levine, was one of the finalists, and she is here today to sing with our choir. So, Ashley, would you come forward just so we can say legislative assistant in Washington, D.C. Please come. He will talk to us a lot about the political system, how we can be engaged, things we should know. That's from 6.30 to 7.30 Wednesday evening in Havoc Course.
seeking God together. Lift up your heart. God be with you. Let us share with one another the peace of Christ.
I am so happy to see you here today. This is a very special day for so many people. Do you know what today is? Mother's Day. It is Mother's Day. And here at Gables UCC, we celebrate Mother's Day in a very special way because we know that there are lots of ways that we are mothered, that sometimes it's just not mothers that are part of our lives who give us life and so forth, but it can be teachers, it can be preachers, it can be church leaders and ushers, it can even be dads who take care of us in very special ways that kind of mother us. And who? And gifts. And gifts. They give us gifts, don't they? Yes, I like you. You can come. And grandmas, absolutely. And aunts, I absolutely. There are so many wonderful women who can be like mothers to us, who can teach us how to be and how to act and about life and about love and about the faithful life. And history, they can teach us a lot about history too, can't they? Or history on, on this day. So, so I would like for you to help me to celebrate the many women of our church family and all the special ways that they serve us and take care of us. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask different groups to stand. And when they stand, I would like for you to say with me, we love you and we thank you. Can you try that with me? We love you and we thank you. Oh, you guys are great. Should we try it one more time? We, we love, love you, you and we thank you. you. So the first group I'm going to ask to stand are all of our great grandmothers. Are there great grandmothers here? Oh, grandmothers to stand. Are there grandmothers? Oh my goodness, look at this. Yeah. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. And on behalf of the Bell Choir, we would love to give a big, big thank you to Seth Patterson for all of his work this year working with us. We walk in the company of the women who have gone before, mothers of the faith, both named and unnamed, testifying with ferocity and faith to the spirit of wisdom and healing. They are the judges, the prophets, the martyrs, the warriors, poets, lovers, and saints who are near to us in our memory and our dreaming. who judged the Israelites with authority and strength. Who used her position as queen to ensure the welfare of her people. Who kept and cradled the wisdom of the ages. Who wept at the empty tomb until the risen Christ appeared. Who led an early church and the empire of Rome? Who wed imagination and theology, proclaiming wellness as reality? Who stood against oppression, righteously declaring her womanhood in 1852? who turned their grief to strength, standing together to remember the disappeared children of war with a holy indignation. Who named the purple hue of womanish strength. Who teach us to resist evil with boldness, to lead with wisdom and to heal, amen.
You should put these words of mine in your heart and soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Write them on the door post on, of your house and on your gates so that your days and the door, days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. Friends, listen. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. My mother to name a favorite hymn or a favorite scripture is like asking most mothers who are their favorite kids. It's hard to narrow them down. It's hard to get, a, get them to come to a decision. But one thing I can say is that most of their, her songs that she communicated to me as her favorites in the scriptures all had a common theme. It all centered around waiting on the Lord. And it, it summed up into a, a scripture by uh, Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be strong. May your heart be of courage, wait on the Lord. And similarly, the, the favorite song that I, I found to, to meet that theme is a song that came into our family about 30 years ago. Um, it's a song that I sang for our family when my mother's grandson of 21 was killed and for his funeral service. Where you start questioning why, when you start not understanding God's love and purpose in life, our theme was to wait on the Lord and let, the, let the, the process work through and that God would pull us through. And even decisions that were difficult, we used this song in meditation when we had to come to a decision we waited on the Lord. So I hope this song brings joy to you and maybe add it to your meditation. It's a simple song. I need to be still and let God love me. Need to be 
In my eighth grade English class, one of our assignments was to write our autobiography, which included coming up with a catchy title for our life story. I called mine, My Life in a Prayer Factory. As a kid, I was pretty convinced our life as a pastor's family was not normal. They called us PKs, preacher's kids. We were supposed to be more pure and much better behaved than our friends were. So my brother Bruce and I devoted ourselves to taking down that reputation. <laughs> In second grade, I volunteered my father to be room mother. I said to my teacher, my dad'll do it. He doesn't have a real job, he's a pastor. <laughs> when we answered the phone, we weren't allowed to just say hello. We were taught to say Methodist parsonage, that was a lot for my sister Judy to say when she was younger, so when she answered, it became messiest parsonage. <laughs> if we answered the phone and it was Helen Lacey, she would ask us to pray for her. So my mother typed up prayers and taped them to the windowsill so we could pull back the curtains and pray for Miss Lacey. In high school, being the PK meant that no matter what club office I ran for, I was always elected chaplain. <laughs> I guess they figured if anybody knew how to pray, it must be Ron Morgan. When I came home from my first semester in college, I said to my mother, now that I'm an adult, I don't think I have to go to church anymore. She was ready with the classic mom response. That's fine. When the next tuition bill comes, we'll give it directly to you. <laughs> Looking back, I am grateful for my life in a prayer factory. Without it, I wouldn't have learned to play the organ in seventh grade, and I wouldn't have played for my father's church services all through high school. In my senior year of high school, I would not have answered an ad in the Columbus Dispatch for an experienced pipe organist, and I wouldn't have gotten my first church job for $18 a week. I would miss looking out over a candlelit church and seeing all your faces singing Silent Night on Christmas Eve. I would miss raising our candles on verse 3. I wouldn't have met Steve at Pilgrim UCC in Cleveland over 20 years ago, and we wouldn't have felt drawn and led to Coral Gables UCC, the place that has played such a central role in our spiritual and social lives. My mother taught me to love the music of the church. When she played piano, it was mostly hymns from the old Methodist hymnal. Toward the end of her life, as she lost strength, we played hymns as duets, me playing the harmony while she played the hymn tune. On family trips, we sang in the car, and participation was not optional. Mom and Dad were in the front seat singing harmony. The three of us sat in the back carrying the melody. 
Every June, we went to annual conference, the United Methodist version of General Synod in the UCC in Lakeside, Ohio. Each morning as a family, we went to the Bishop's Hour, the morning devotional, before our fathers began their days of long and tedious meetings. Hearing an auditorium filled with pastors singing their faith, we heard the spirit-filled songs of people who loved their chosen life as servants of the church. That singing still inspires me today. I like all kinds of music, but church hymns are my favorite. Singing in churches is one of the few places where we still sing together as a community and express faith, hopefulness, and uncertainty as we raise our voices together in song. My mother also made sure we were surrounded by the love and joy of the Christian community. Nothing made me feel more comfortable and safe than falling asleep while mom was hosting women's society meetings in our living room with the buzz of conversation, singing, and laughter floating upstairs to our bedrooms. At annual conference in Lakeside, my family, along with other pastors' families and my grandparents, gathered for evening coffee and dessert on the screened porches of summer cottages. I felt sure that our joy was of a higher level because it was rooted in faith, and I felt grateful to be surrounded by that loving community. Like so many mothers, our mother was a model for putting other people's needs before her own. She served as church secretary for no pay. She taught Sunday school and held leadership roles in the Women's Society of Christian Service. Like Pastor Lori's house, our living room was a frequent church meeting place with my mother as hostess. When we went to college, mom went back to work and her entire salary went to paying tuition bills so her children could graduate from college debt free. At the age of 53, our mother was diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. I was not a frequent flyer in the world of prayer, but I decided this would be a good time to start. I began to pray specifically for her healing, but soon realized I had not paid much attention to the childhood lessons I had learned about prayer. When it became clear she wasn't going to get better, she made it her calling to show her family and friends the strength of her faith and the grace and dignity you can choose to show in dying. She always worried about my life of spiritual uncertainty. She asked me if the way she was living her life in dying had strengthened my faith. I said yes, but I didn't mean it, because what I was praying for wasn't going to happen. But while my prayers to keep our mother with us weren't answered, her prayers for her family were. We experienced the bonds of family, knowing our time together was limited. We laughed and retold family stories and learned that joy and laughter can soften loss and sadness. In the 28-year-old version of my emerging self, I began to see the hints of the person my mother hoped I would become, a level of compassion I hadn't seen before, finding myself caring about others more than I had thought possible. The hymn anthem we were about to sing was written by John Wesley, who called his friends to his bedside to sing these words. In the final weeks of her disease, ALS took away my mother's ability to speak. In the memorial service she wrote herself, we sang, I'll praise my maker while I've breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. The collective voice of our parents and those who shaped us are voices that will always be with us. Sometimes we wish the voices would go away. Sometimes they make us feel guilty, but they always encourage us to be the best version of ourselves, to live fully, to love wastefully, and to be all that God intends us to be. Those voices will never be lost in death. Amen. <laughs>
people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn, and we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them, and we help them in return.
Let us together welcome these new members to our church family by using the words printed in the bulletin. We welcome you with joy into the long life of this church. We promise you our friendship and our prayers as we support one another in the work to which we feel called, striving for peace and justice among all people, protecting and restoring the Amen. 